Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to Titus chapter 2, please. If you don't know where Titus is, find Philemon and go back one book. If you don't know where Philemon is, find Hebrews and go back two books and you'll be right there. Titus chapter 2. Thank you all for being here tonight. Again, I missed being in this pulpit on Sunday, uh, but we did get to broadcast from my house, and uh, I think some folks are getting used to seeing my living room <laughs> and my grandfather clock and uh, all the rest of it, and so it's just not the same, that's for sure, but I'm glad that we get to do that, praising the Lord. All right, tonight we are continuing in our current study of what we believe and Titus chapter 2, we're going to read verses 11 through the end of the chapter, please. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 15, and read together with me on verse 11, and then you read every other verse with me through the end of the chapter. Everyone now? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in, the, in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And tonight we focus, of course, uh, on that 13th verse as we continue in this study. And tonight we will look at what we believe about the blessed hope. What we believe about the blessed hope. And Brother Dale, I'm going to ask you to give me a little more on these up here for me, if you would, please. It just feels just a little bit weak for me. And uh, that will help me and my voice tonight. And I appreciate that. Heavenly Father, teach us now and help us. I pray that we might have uh, listening ears and open hearts, and Lord, that we wouldn't just fill our heads with any knowledge, that we would actually have our hearts touched and challenged by you. So Father, help us now, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. What you believe will determine how you live. That is absolutely the truth. What you believe will determine how you live. And right now we are in the midst of a study on what we believe here at Timberline Baptist Church because, oh, let me ask you this question, what do you believe? What do you believe and why do you believe that particular way? We have so many today that say so many things. I, uh, I have friends and I have folks that I don't know who have a lot of different teachings and doctrines that they follow. And I wonder sometimes where on earth they get their belief. They might take some verse that's obscure and take it out of context and build a whole doctrine on it. But something that I learned a long time ago, uh, back back in my college days, and that was a long time ago, and when that was simply this, is that truth always flies on two wings, meaning it's balanced. Truth is balanced. In other words, it's compared to a bird that might have a broken wing. Now, he's got two wings, but one of them's broken. Well, he uh, might flap his wings, make a lot of noise, stir up a lot of dust, and go around in a lot of circles, but he's not going to fly. And a lot of beliefs that many hold to today, uh, they literally, uh, they flap their wings, they make a lot of noise, they, uh, uh, they stir up a lot of dust, and they go around in circles, but ladies and gentlemen, they simply don't fly with what they believe. And so what we have to do is take the word of God and the word of God only and determine what we believe concerning different doctrines. That's the word of God is not only our, uh, our final authority, but the word of God is our only authority on what we believe. We have to understand that volumes have been written about what men believe, but if it's not based solely upon the word of God, then it's of no count, and no good. So far in this series, we have heard what we believe about the Bible, what we believe about the Trinity, what we believe about creation, what we believe about Jesus, the very Son of God, what we believe about his physical, bodily resurrection from the dead, 
what we believe about the Holy Spirit. We even learned about sins that Christians can commit against the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says a Christian should not grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. And that's only one, meaning that he can be sinned against by God's own people. We have also learned what we believe about the state of man, that all men are sinners, and we are born that way, and we do not, we, we're not sinners because we sin, we sin because we are born sinners. We learned uh, about what we believe about the scope of salvation, and uh, there are so many doctrines today that salvation is not meant for everybody, that God only picks and chooses whom he wants to save, and that's it. But the Bible teaches entirely and totally against that in every aspect, and we went through a lot of details on that. We also learned what it takes. We learned what it means to become a child of God. What does it take? And, of course, it's not church membership, and it's not living righteously, and it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And then last time we were together, we learned what we believe about eternal salvation. In other words, not just assurance of salvation, because that's a separate doctrine. But what does the Bible teach about eternal security? This once saved, always saved. Does the Bible teach that? Well, what we said last week from the Word of God obviously teaches that. And we gave great detail on that. In fact, I handed out to you last week a, uh, a handout of 45 verses that mention eternal life in one way or another. Eternal life, life eternal, everlasting life, and life everlasting. 45 references, 44 out of the New Testament, one from the book of Daniel. And my, how important that is. And you know, if God said it was eternal, that means it doesn't end. Anybody there? <laughs> Think about that. And if it did end, and if God would take it back, and God would go back on his word, then it would not be eternal. The Bible says in two places that God cannot lie. Why? Because it's not in him to lie. God can never go against his word. Well, as we continue this sermon series, today we're going to see what we believe about the blessed hope. That is, what we believe about the rapture. The rapture. Here's what it says in our doctrinal statement of Timberline Baptist Church. And I quote, We believe in the blessed hope, the personal, premillennial, pre-tribulational, and imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he shall gather all believers unto himself and take them on to heaven. That's what we believe. And that is in our doctrinal statement. That is what we have always believed, and we've not wavered from that one little bit. Jesus, like the song we sang at the very beginning of the service tonight, Jesus is coming again. And it may be morning, and it may be noon, it may be evening, but surely soon, Jesus is coming again. The blessed hope, that is, according to Titus 2 and verse 13, is that time when Jesus will return for all of the saved and transport them to heaven. Let me read verse 13 again. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's when he comes back for us. You want to pay attention tonight. You're not going to want to forget the sermon uh, scriptures that are used this evening. The study that I have done, the study that you need to know about. And so this particular doctrine, by the way, has become a real bone of contention in many Christian circles. And that's a shame that it has. And by the way, it's not really found in fundamental circles, but it's found more in the new evangelical circles. There's always some kind of an argument. As one new evangelical said to me one evening when he was visiting our church, he said, you Baptists, he said, you like them, you like them proof texts, don't you? And I'm thinking, yeah. I like a proof text because it proves something, proving to me that this new evangelical that visited our service did not have a proof text to prove what he believes. I guess it could be this, and it could be that, it may be this, and it may be that. No, no, the word of God is very clear about these things. And so there are many questions surrounding this doctrine. Two of the most common are these. Number one, is the rapture literal or is it symbolic? Is the rapture of all believers literal or is it only symbolic? And the second question is this, is will the rapture happen before the tribulation, after the tribulation, or halfway through the tribulation? Or as one preacher said, one before the tribulation and one at the end of the tribulation. 
The one before the tribulation is for good Christians, and the one at the end of the tribulation is for bad Christians. And guess where we're all going to end up? I guess we're all going to end up in that last one because none of us are the Christian that we ought to be. And uh, by the way, what a silly doctrine that is to try to believe. I remember I asked a preacher one time that I was on his, uh, I was on his ordination committee, and he got up and said that. And I looked at him and I, I raised my hand because I, I asked questions and I said, is that what you believe or is that what you're studying to figure out what you believe? Because if that's what you believe, I can't sign your ordination certificate. You could have heard a pen drop in that room on carpet. He was standing and before all of us preachers and he looked over to the right at another man. And then he looked back at me and he said, I'm studying it. <laughs> And I thought, okay, I, I can sign it as long as you're studying it. And I don't know if he was studying or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, he's ordained now anyhow. So, tonight I want to give you just a few things, and I want you to listen very, very carefully. Number one, if you're taking notes, the rapture of all believers will definitely happen. The rapture of all believers will definitely happen. The word rapture, by the way, is not found in the Bible. I can't tell you how many new evangelical Christians have said to me, you know, the word rapture is not in the Bible. <laughs> well, neither is the word Trinity, but it's taught in the Bible. And by the way, the word Bible is not found in the Bible either, just in case you're wondering. There are a lot of words that are not found in the Bible, but the doctrine of those words are found there. The word rapture, by the way, simply means a transporting of a pers person from one place to another, and in this case, especially to heaven. The transporting of an individual from Nahir to heaven. That's what we're talking about. Hence, the rapture is that time when Jesus will transport his people from this earth to heaven. Now, I know you know where this is in the Bible, and you can probably quote it. But in John chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3, do you remember his words, what he had to say? He said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, if it were not so, uh, excuse me, he says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said that. That's a promise. That's not this preacher saying it. That's this preacher reading it. Uh, that's not my making it up. That's my believing what Jesus said. And he said, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm coming back to get you, and I'm going to take you to heaven with me. And the songwriter said, won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there? Yes. Having no burdens to bear, joyfus, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Won't it be wonderful there? Looking forward to heaven already. And I really mean that with all of my heart. I was thinking about this. Just, I think sometimes I'm morbid. Are you morbid? I'm morbid every now and then. I was thinking now that I'm 65 years of age. I was thinking all my contemporaries are in their 60s right now. You realize that? All my You know how hard it is being the same age as old people? Uh, it's just difficult. It just really is. But all my contemporaries are in their 60s. I was a youth director for a long time. All my teenagers are in their 50s. And their children are in their 20s. And graduating from college and getting married. Think about that just for an, all my children are in their 30s and 40s. And you, they say when you get older, they say you go to more funerals than you do to birthday parties. And I guess that's pretty much true because folks that we know get old with us and we don't, these bodies don't last forever. So I'm looking forward to the day that Jesus comes back so that we can all be gathered together and be back with our families and friends and all the rest of it. Because the older you get, the closer you get to that day, you see. So first of all, the first fact I want to share with you is that the rapture of all believers is definitely something that's going to happen. And Jesus promised that. He did not say this is a story. He did not say this is a parable. He did not say any of that. He said, this is what's going to happen. I'm making a mansion. And when I go away, I just want you to know I'm going to come back. And I'm going to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And all God's people said, Amen. Number two, it's going to happen very suddenly. 
It's going to happen very suddenly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 51. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth here, says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now notice what we read at the very beginning. We shall not all sleep. That means not everybody's going to die. Paul was expecting Jesus back in his day. He said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I was always brought up to believe that the twinkling of an eye was about one thirtieth of a second. I don't know how fast it is. Somebody tried to measure it one time. All I know is it's going to be quick and it's going to happen before you know it. And the Bible says it's going to be something that happens suddenly. It's not going to be a gradual thing. It's going to happen all of a sudden, boom, all of a sudden we are trans out of this old world and we are gone to heaven so number one I said it's something that will definitely happen number two it's going to happen very quickly and thirdly the Bible says it's going to be something that brings comfort it's going to be something that brings comfort now if a, a person is unsaved and does not know the Lord as their Savior this ought to scare them to death why because that means they don't get raptured out of this world they're left behind the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Now, this is a passage that all of us preachers read at a funeral. This is a passage that uh, those who attend funerals, they hear this passage over again and over again and over again. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep. Now there's that reference again to being asleep. The Bible says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is a reference here to, uh, to death. It's not a reference to soul sleep. As our Seventh-day Adventist uh, uh, friends would say, that's talking about soul sleep. That is not talking about soul sleep. It's talking about death. And as Jerry Clower put it, it means graveyard dead. And it says, concerning them which are dead, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. When's that? John 14. Jesus said, I'm coming again. <clears throat> We're talking here about Jesus' fulfillment of his promise uh, to come again. And it says here, uh, the Bible says, The coming of the Lord, remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Look at the words. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The coming of the Lord is something that will bring comfort. I'm always reminded, um, uh, Ray Hart, years ago, been in heaven now for a lot of years, um, he wrote a song called I'll See You Again. One of the, I think, one of the most precious songs that has ever been penned, ever. And uh, in there, Dr. John R. Rice is getting to talk. 
and listening to him talk. I, I miss Dr. Rice. He was such a good man, and he was one of my heroes in the faith. But Ray Hart included the voice of Dr. John Rice there. And Dr. Rice starts naming off people from his, from his contemporaries that had died and gone on. He talked about his mom. He said, I'll see you again. I'll see you again. He said, it won't be long. I'll see you again. In December of 1980, John Rice got to see him again. And he's been with him ever since. And I think about that. You know, uh, listen, uh, both of my parents are in heaven. I get to see him again one of these days. Looking forward to that. Both of Robin's parents are in heaven. You get to see him again. One of these days. Could be tonight. Uh, get to see him again. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I think about how after my mom passed away, my dad remarried Esther, and Esther uh, was a widow, and her first husband had passed away. And just in the last two weeks, her son passed away, uh, Greg, a contemporary of mine who went to school with me. And uh, Greg is in heaven tonight, and you know what? It won't be long. Esther will see him again. And uh, she said to me just this week when she called, she says, oh, she said, Danny, I miss him so much. I miss him so much. And I said to her, I said, well, it won't be long. I said, we'll all get to see him again. That's what it means, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Because those of us who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with those who are raised from the dead first, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And we're going to get to be with those lost, uh, not lost, but those uh, saved loved ones that have died and gone on before us. We're going to get to be with them and see them again. And you think about everybody in your life that you love that has died and gone on to heaven. And I realize it's not a pleasant thought for some because not everybody that we've ever known has died saved. But you think about those people that you know that died born again and they're on their way to heaven. I've had people tell me this. They'll say, Pastor, I don't know if so-and-so was saved when they died. What do you think? And I don't know what to think, but I can say this. I, I do know that we don't know everything that happened in that person's life if they ever had a time when they had received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And that's what brings the comfort. I said we have to trust what the Lord has done, things that we don't know that God knows. But that's why the rapture is a time of comfort. I've referred to this many times through the years. But Dottie Rambo uh, wrote a song, and she's, she's, she's uh, reciting at the beginning of the song, and she said that while she was growing up as a little girl, she heard about the coming of the Lord, and she said, it scared me to death. It scared me to death. Well, hey, let Jesus come back. Let that trumpet sound. Let that angel shout. Uh, let's, let's go. Praise the Lord. It doesn't scare me to go. Uh, and making those preparations on this side of the grave is the only place you can make those preparations. You can't make them anywhere else. And no, it's on this side of the grave. Nothing. The Bible says, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. There is no chance after death to be saved. So I'm looking forward to seeing those again. That's why it says in 1 Thessalonians 13, or 4 and verse 18, it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I don't know, you go to a funeral and the pastor reads that passage. I don't know if it brings comfort to folks at that moment because you're suffering through a lot of sadness and a lot of heartache and a lot of heartbrokenness at that point. But then you think about it later on and it's like John Rice said, it won't be long, I'll see him again. It won't be long, I'll see him again. So then I come to this part of this Bible study tonight. Number four, if the rapture happened today, what would happen to all those things we intended to do? If the rapture were to happen today, tonight, this evening, before you go to bed, during the night, the Bible says he'll come as a thief in the night, but that doesn't mean he's coming at night because it's night somewhere in the world every, every hour of the day. But he's going to come like a thief in the night. But to all those things that we intended to do, what's going to happen to those? Satan thrives on the good intentions of the saved, which never get accomplished. He does. He thrives on that. Much of the time, we are waiting on someone else to do the job that we intended to do. Good intentions never accomplished affect the working of the Holy Spirit in this world. Did you know that? Good intentions never accomplished affect the working of the Holy Spirit in this world. See, the Holy Spirit works through us in this world and to the world. He works through us that are in this world to the world. That's what he does. And the Holy Spirit wants to bless us, but cannot if we do not give him an avenue through which to work. 
And if we're always intending to do something and always putting something off, you say he'll just have to use somebody else. Well, maybe he will and maybe he won't. You see, the good intentions which you fail to accomplish rob you of rewards. And these rewards are rewards that one day we're supposed to lay at Jesus' feet. Because we get blessed for serving the Lord. But yet there are many today who put off serving the Lord. And I'll do it tomorrow or maybe later or I'll do this at another time. And I want to say this. Jesus gave his life on Calvary. What if he just, what if they were just good intentions and he never gave his life on Calvary? You say, well, he had to do that. No, he didn't. He even said so. He said, don't you know that I can now presently call to my heavenly father and he would send 12 legion of angels and they would deliver me from all y'all? That's kind of like what the Greek says. Do you realize that? What he could have done? But he didn't. He didn't. I'm glad he didn't put it off. You see, we'd be in a world of hurt if he only intended to give his life on Calvary and never did. But here's another question for you. If the rapture happened today, what would happen to those people that we were supposed to lead to Christ? What will happen to them? Well, the saved are left here on earth to accomplish the will of God through the working of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, the saved would be taken home to heaven at the point of salvation. That's an interesting question that I've seen posed many times over the years. How come when I got saved, God didn't just take me to heaven then? It's because he's got a work for you to do. He's got people you need to touch. You have a sphere of influence in your life that nobody else has. You will touch lives that I can't touch. And I will touch lives that you can't touch. And all of us have that. It's called a sphere or a circle of influence that we have in our lives. And God has put us in that sphere of influence for a particular reason. You see, there are some people that only you can lead to Christ because they're in your sphere of influence. And that's it. An old illustration that I will give, just a very, very old. I was a bus worker in Chicago, and I was in a hurry one beautiful Saturday afternoon after I had called on a lot of my bus route, and I was hur uh, scurrying. I think that's the proper word, hurry, scurry. I was scurrying down the sidewalk because I had a place to go, and I walked past a lady standing on the corner waiting for a bus, and the Spirit of God prompted my heart and wanted me to go back and witness to her, I stopped on the sidewalk and I said out loud to the Lord, I said, no, I got places to go. And I kept walking. And I told the Lord no. And I kept walking. I got so under conviction, suddenly I stopped in my tracks and I said, okay, Lord. I said out loud. I, I really did. I was talking out loud. Of course, people talking out loud on the sidewalks of Chicago is nothing new. And so I fit right in. And uh, so I stopped dead I mean, dead stopped right there on the sidewalk. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to go back and witness to her, but she better get saved. You say, you actually said that to the Lord? I don't ever want to say it again. And I've never said it again, but I said it on that day there. I've made the confession. Okay. And I need the double backhand blessing or something. So I turned my body around, I went back to that bus stop and I stopped and I talked to this, this lady and I said to her, I said, ma'am, the uh, Lord wanted me to come back and talk to you. And I said, let me ask you this question. I said, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? She says, I don't know that. And I said, would you like to know that? And she said, yes, I would. And I remember I went through a, the plan of salvation and I showed that dear lady how to put her faith in Jesus Christ. And that lady got saved. Isn't that a wonderful thing? <laughs> but you know what? I was going to put it off. I wonder if that lady would have ever gotten saved. And by the way, as soon as we went through some assurance verses, guess what happened? The bus came and picked her up. The bus came and picked her up. Another time we'd gone street preaching. Uh, if you've never done that or never been around that, it's quite an experience. But I remember that my bus captain one day said, now, now he said, brother, he's from North Carolina. He said, brother Dan, he said, I'm going to go up here on these steps and I'm going to start preaching. He said, and I want you to gather a crowd around and I want you to give them gospel tracts and all that. So he got to preaching. Nobody was listening to him. And I started handing out gospel tracts and people started hanging around me. And I started giving, and, and I thought, well, I'm not supposed to be doing any preaching. I, and, so, and so I started sharing the plan of salvation. Another group of teenagers came up. They were on a long trip. 
And I had to start over because they kept saying, tell us what you're talking about. Tell us. And before you knew it, I had a crowd of about 25 or 30 young people standing around me. And I'm standing there preaching. I'm giving them the plan of salvation. That isn't what we intended to do. The guy that was doing the preaching, he left where he was standing and came over and joined my group. On that day, we had about 25 people saved. Very amazing. And by the way, as soon as we got done with assurance verses, guess what happened? Their school leader came out, and all these teenagers were ushered onto a bus to go back to school, to go back where they came from. Uh, I remember we had a, a big day uh, in, on, on our bus routes in Chicago. And on that day, we had 126,000 people that attended services all over Chicago. I remember that. And on, on my particular route, it was the individual that had the largest attendance on his bus was supposed to do the preaching. His name was Levi Robinson because he had a very large route. And uh, we had a crowd gathered there, and we had all of our kids and adults and everybody had come. And uh, they walked up to me, and I wasn't planning on preaching. And he said, he said, Brother Dan, he said, you're preaching. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm not preaching. There's no way I'm preaching. And I said, uh, that's supposed to be Levi that preaches today. He says, well, if things are not working out, Levi is not preaching. He said, you are. Are you ready? All of a sudden, I got ready. What if I would have said, no, no, don't, not me. I got up and I preached on that day, and we had, I think it was over 100 people that got saved in that meeting, and one of the hard-heartedest moms on their bus route got saved that day. What if I would have said no? February 16, 1964, Bill Kellogg preached when the invitation was given by my pastor, Bob Humphreys, I had told my dad, I pulled on his coat, and I said, I need to go get saved, Daddy. And he patted me on the back and said, go on, son. And I walked down the aisle, but I'll never forget, the pastor raised his hand for Ben Conrad to come talk with me. What if Ben Conrad would have said no? Say, well, they would have found somebody else. We don't know that. He called on Ben Conrad. What if Ben Conrad would have put it off and decided that he didn't want to, he intended not to witness I'm glad that Ben Conrad witnessed to me that night because I got saved on that night. And all I can simply say is this, is the people that we're supposed to lead to Christ may never get saved if we put off and put off and put off what we're supposed to be doing. Don't put off serving the Lord. Don't put off giving your all to the Lord. You see, the ones that we lead to Christ might lead someone else to the Lord, and they might lead someone else to the Lord, and they might lead someone else to the Lord. And before you know it, a lot of folks have gotten saved before it's all said and done. But if we leave that one unsaved, maybe that would never happen. We also would give an account one of these days, you see, for the life that we put off for the Lord. You know, I got saved at eight. I didn't dedicate my life to the Lord till I was 17. Say, what was wrong with you? Oh, I just didn't want to do it. But I'm glad I did it at 17. But I've often wondered what could have been accomplished in my life if I would have stayed faithful from the time I was eight and been in church all those years until the time I was 17. I've often wondered what would have happened. I guess you can't live on what ifs and maybes, that's for sure. But I'm glad that I did what I did. All that to bring us to this. If the rapture happened today, what would happen to you? I mean, would you be transported out of this world like Jesus said, I'm coming to take you? Or that trumpet will sound and the angel will shout, would you be one that goes up or would you be one that stays behind? The truth is, are you sure that you're saved, not by religion, but by Jesus Christ himself, you see? Have you really accepted him as your personal savior? The songwriter John Starnes penned these words. And I, I, I listened to this song today. I'm not going to sing it to you, but I want you to listen to the words. It says, when the lost at any cost, as we look all around us, all the fields are white, they're ripened unto harvest, yet so quickly comes the night. Christians must get busy. There's so much work to do. Here's an urgent task awaiting you. Souls are crying, men are dying. Won't you lead them to the cross? Go and find them. Please help to win them. Win the lost at any cost. Check your fold, my Christian brother. See if all your children are in. Are there some still straying in the uh, blackened fields of sin? You must go out and win them. Go quickly without delay. Soon the trump of God shall end the day. 
go out and win, rescue from sin. Day's almost done, and the battle's almost won. Souls are crying, men are dying, win the lost at any cross. Souls are crying, men are dying, won't you lead them to the cross? Go and find them, please help to win them, win the lost at any cost. And all that about the rapture, because when he comes back, we don't witness anymore, we're gone. There's a work to accomplish while we are here. And it's important that we take it very, very seriously. Tonight, I don't want you to fill your heads with knowledge about the rapture. I want you to know about it. I want you to know what the Bible says about it. And we've looked at that. But I wanted to challenge every one of us about our witness and about our living. Because Jesus could come soon. Shall we stand?